Lindsay. I am super excited that you're here and I just want to get us oriented to Zoom a little bit uh, before we begin. So even though you're all probably experts at this point, let's take a few seconds to practice a couple of things. So first, be sure your camera is on. I love to see your faces. If you, you know, need to stretch or do something weird, go ahead and turn it off for a minute. But it's wonderful to be able to see each other and also for me to see who I'm actually talking to. That is so much more fun when I'm presenting virtually. Uh, so take a second and practice switching your view to gallery mode so that you can see everybody. So switch your own view to gallery. And then you can switch it back to speaker when it's not an interactive moment. So just practice toggling between those two views for a second. And while you're on gallery mode, just look and see all of the beautiful souls here. You're not alone in experiencing stress and wanting more joy. We're in this together. Now let's practice muting and unmuting together. So go ahead and unmute yourselves and give everybody a big woohoo or hello. 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 Oh. All right. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hello. I like the energy. Good. That's a good start. Now go ahead and mute yourselves again. And uh, stay muted, please, unless you've been invited to interact, which I will do several times during our time together. It just creates a cleaner recording and a more present experience for everyone if we're not hearing weird random sounds in the background from wherever you are. Like you may, in fact, hear my dog break into my office at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully the other people in the house will keep her entertained. Uh, I encourage all of you to take a moment right now and put those phones on do not disturb or whatever device you have around you, put it on do not disturb and give yourself this hour to 90 minutes. We'll probably run close to 90 minutes to be fully present. And also Let's make it fun for each other. Feel free to use the emoticon buttons if your computer has it. I love to see smileys and hearts and explosive confetti. So go ahead and use those if you're seeing something you like. Thank you, Renee. And you can ask questions and be active in the chat. I may not pause to answer them during my talk, especially when I have slides up. I won't even see them. But my fabulous friend, Renee, Renee, wave your hand. We'll make sure that I see them and get to them toward the end when I make dedicated time for Q&A. Okay. Awesome. Now that that business is out of the way, go ahead and put your view back on gallery mode and raise your hands if you would like to wake up tomorrow a little bit happier, a little less stressed, a little more calm, a little more joyful. Yes. Oh, look at your beautiful smiles. Even thinking about it makes you feel better. <laughs> And see how you are not alone in this. This is our human experience. We all want more moments of joy and we all want less stress. And I have good news and bad news about happiness to share with you today. The bad news is that, uh, sorry, I was just making sure I was recording actually. The bad news is that unhappiness is an epidemic these days in the US and also across the Western world. It's not just the US. One out of four women in this country, however, is on an antidepressant, and even though we have more than we've ever had, we are unhappier than ever. The good news is that science has cracked the happiness code, and we actually know what it takes to be happier. And that's amazing news, and that's what should be taught in schools today. I actually do teach a class in, in the local high school, and I'm teaching some of it to you today. I'm going to be sharing with you some of the most exciting findings in happiness and even more important, what you can do right away to be happier. You will leave with practical tools, thus the name practical happiness, that you can use every single day to be happier. And I also want to make sure that we have some fun together because life is meant to be fun. And this masterclass is about happiness. So let's start off with a few laughs and give me a chance to practice sharing my screen. Here we go. All right. I always have a disclaimer. Hopefully you'll find these funny too. I have really corny humor. <laughs> so happiness. 
a particularly cunning mental illness that causes people around you to feel annoyed and uneasy. <laughs> this is true, but don't let it stop you. And then I, I, I visit a lot of senior communities, and this is one of my favorites. We will always be friends till we're old and senile. Then we can be new friends. <laughs> and I found this one today. Why are frogs so happy? They eat anything that bugs them. Now, I don't recommend this as a practice, but hey, <laughs> you do what you have to do to up-level your joy. <laughs> but hopefully today I'll teach you a, a few healthier habits than that. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop my share here. Okay. Before we get into the meat of why we're here today, and before I even tell you more about me, I want each of you to take a moment to rate your current happiness level on a scale of one to 10. One being the lowest you've ever been, the least happy, the most stressed, and 10 being the least stressed and the happiest you've ever been. Where are you today, right now in this present moment? Just write it down. Oh, thank you, Lucy, for popping that in the chat. You can pop it in the chat. You guys are pretty happy already. And uh, pop it in the chat and then save it for later. So maybe write it down. We'll come back to it later. Sharon's an eight. Awesome. Look at you guys. So happy. And yet notice you're here to learn even more skills, to be even happier, because that is a possibility for you. Okay. Some lower scores, so I'm so glad you're here because I bet you, and we'll find out at the end, that your scores go up today and you'll have skills to keep raising them. Keep popping those in the chat or set them aside for yourself. Thank you for being here. I, today, am going to share with you the three keys to lower your stress and up-level your joy. So let's jump right in to lower at least the stress that you have in your body right now. Pay attention to how simple and easy this practice is, and it's quick. It's going to take about five minutes. And before I start, just notice your stress level. You noticed it right now. You've scored yourself. And pay attention to the stress in your body. Where are you holding tension? What thoughts of yours are running wild? How harried or chaotic do you feel in your mind and in your body? And just notice that for a moment. Okay, we are going to do something now called the quick coherence technique, and it's a three-step process. We begin by simply getting comfortable in your seat. We're going to get comfortable in your seat. Ideally, your feet are on the floor or a surface, and your back is as straight as possible, but comfort matters more than posture or position. And Renee, if you want to switch it so that we turn off the waiting room, if you can do that, and people can just come in if they come in while we're doing this, that way you can stay present too. And if you can't do that, let me know and I will, I will fix it. So pause one moment while you take notice of your body while we see if we can turn off the waiting room. Done, good, cool, thank you. Okay, so now that you're comfortable, relatively comfortable, pretty comfortable, remember posture doesn't matter as much as comfort. And we're gonna be here for three to five minutes. So now go ahead and simply start to notice your breath and let it get a little deeper and a little slower than your usual breath. You don't have to do dramatically deep in and out breaths, just a little deeper and a little slower than your regular breath. And if it feels comfortable for you to do so and you're not at risk of falling asleep, go ahead and close your eyes or soften your gaze Maybe look down so that your attention is on you and your breath. We stay here about a minute, simply noticing the breath getting a little deeper, a little slower, feeling it move in and out of your nose, feeling your belly rise and fall, just breathing. Just breathing. And 
Now, after about a minute or so, and when you're doing this on your own, you can take longer. Step two is to place your attention on your heart center and start to imagine your breath moving in and out of your heart area. For some of you, it might help to rest your hands on your heart. For others, it might help to visualize a white light moving in and out of your heart center with each breath, just to keep your attention on your heart. Continue breathing that slower, deeper breath, imagining it moving through your heart area in and out. And we do this for about a minute. Keeping your attention on your heart while you breathe. I can see some of you already beginning to relax and experiencing the benefits of just something as simple as a little more breath, a little attention to your heart. And let's take it one final step further now. While you keep what you have, continuing to breathe with your attention on your heart, now I invite you to consciously cultivate feelings of love, appreciation, and gratitude. You might imagine someone or some place or some pet that brings up these feelings of love, appreciation, and gratitude. Let yourself really feel it. Consciously cultivate it. Feel the love. Let it rise up in you. You might even notice a smile coming to your face as you cultivate these emotions of love, appreciation, and gratitude. And we stay here for about a minute, just allowing the richness and the full expression of love, appreciation, and gratitude to fill us up. Let yourself fill up with love, appreciation, and gratitude. And then when you're ready, take a deep breath and maybe give your fingers or toes a little wiggle, maybe your whole body. Go ahead and open your eyes. Yep, stretch it out. And notice how you feel. And here I welcome you to unmute yourself or pop in the chat. How do you feel now? I feel refreshed. Yeah, thank you. Me too. Had <laughs> all those start the event nerves and I'm all relaxed and happy, Roseanne. Yeah, mind is quieter, a little more peace. Thank you, Kevin. Lighter. Just that was four or five minutes. Can you see yourself taking four or five minutes? to create more peace in your body, to relax, to chill, to feel calmer and lighter in just a few minutes? Who's willing to practice that? Yeah, I invite you to practice this once or twice every day for the next week or two and really notice what happens for you. And if the holiday season really stresses you out or life is simply hitting you hard right now, practice all month long several times a day. Really, even one minute with each section, just starting to breathe a little deeper and slower, putting your attention on your heart, and then cultivating consciously those feelings of love, appreciation, and gratitude can calm your nervous system. And actually, what you've just all done is lower the level of stress hormone, cortisol, in your bodies, in your blood. And you've put your heart rhythm into what the Institute of Heart Math calls heart rhythm coherence. 
So take a look at this slide here. The red line is a heart rhythm in a person who is experiencing anger, frustration, chaos, stress, and notice how incoherent or all over the place it is. What the research has found is that just five minutes spent in these negative emotional states of anger or frustration puts our heart rhythms into this incoherent rhythm that actually depresses the immune system for up to six hours in just five minutes of sitting with those negative emotions, up to six hours of a lowered immune response. But notice there's another little line there that looks much more coherent and the practice you just utilized does the opposite. It puts your heart rhythm back into a coherent rhythm and just five minutes of feeling, love, gratitude, appreciation boosts your immune system for up to six hours. That's pretty amazing, huh? Who thinks that's amazing? Up to six hours of a boosted immune system. Now, I have a personal story to share about this because I am one of the happiest people I know, and it is because I'm consistently practicing these tools by myself, with myself, when I'm teaching it to others. I'm getting into a state of love, appreciation, and gratitude several times a day. So pretty consistently whew, boosting my immune system. Now, over the past several months, everyone in my household, except for me, got sick with COVID. Not all at once either. Uh, every one of us has been vaccinated and boosted, but here's how it went. My 13-year-old son picked it up on a band trip to Cedar Point uh, for July 4th. I thought he had just a little cold. We'd been cuddling together, watching Stranger Things, you know, like hours together in close quarters. And after five days, I was like, gosh, this cold is just not going away. Let's Let's take a test. It was positive. I never got it. Then in late July, my oldest picked it up at Interlochen, where she was for three weeks, right after, it was literally three weeks after she got her booster shot. So just when it should have been the strongest, she got COVID. And I picked her up on day five of the infection. So she was less infectious to be sure, but I spent hours with her in the car driving her home. I'm in Commerce Township. So, you know, it's a little ways. Uh, I didn't get it. In September, my 16-year-old got it from their dad. The kids go back and forth every week, and that child actually tested positive on their 16th birthday. <laughs> Not the best gift. Now, I did try to stay away from that one because I had an important keynote coming up the next week, but a few days later, my boyfriend came home from an over trip, overseas trip, and he that night started coughing and sneezing while I was in the same bed with him, and I just kind of put the sheet over my head and hope for the best and practice cultivating love and gratitude. And I never got it. Not from all four of the people that I am the closest to. I never got it. And their research finds that happier people are 32% less likely to get sick. So if you're boosting your immune system by practicing this quick and easy technique that you just learned, you'll likely stay healthier too. Or maybe just like with life's challenges, you'll recover faster when life or illness does get you down. So anybody going to practice that on a daily basis? Maybe twice? Yeah. <laughs> Very good, Kathy. Good. Yes. Okay. That one is super easy, right? Chaos to calm in five minutes. You cannot buy that at the store for Christmas this year. Okay. I better introduce myself before we go much further. Would it be okay with you if I told you a little bit about me other than my resistance to illness <laughs> and why this work is so important to me? Thank you. I am Tamara Zoner. I am an award-winning keynote speaker and happiness trainer, and I help people struggling with life transitions to cultivate deeper connections to themselves and others so that they can create a life they love. I do this in several ways working one-on-one -on -one with clients in master classes like this, workshops, keynotes, and even in a local meetup that I run monthly in the Metro Detroit area. And today I am so grateful for the life that I'm living. I wake up every day, almost every day. I mean, there's the occasion early morning where I'm like, oh, but most days I even wake up grateful and thankful. I have a beautiful relationship with each of my three children, teenagers. 
I have a wonderful man in my life who loves me and shows it, who supports in my dreams and believes in them. We just moved into our dream house together this year, and I've left the daily grind behind. I get to make my own schedule. I get to speak and coach and teach people the skills and practices of happiness. And I truly believe that we can change this world one happier person at a time. I know that it's changed my world and my family's, some of my clients' worlds, and I'm happier than I've ever been and so grateful. And it it wasn't always this way. 10 years ago, I was still married to a controlling, emotionally abusive, high-functioning alcoholic. I was not happy. I was far from it. I was angry, so angry. Years before, this incredibly charming French man had romanced me, swept me off my feet, married me, and took me across the world. Little Michigan farm girl married to a French man living in Singapore in the span of eight months. And it was a whirlwind life and an adventure with many good points, but slowly over the years, with these subtle little nicks that took me a long time to even notice, he cut me down so far that I didn't believe in myself anymore. I didn't like myself anymore, and I didn't trust myself anymore. I had lost my voice because he told me that I was too loud, too wrong, or too much. And eventually I believed him. And I quieted down and I shut myself down. I hated myself for allowing myself to be treated that way. Whatever confidence I had possessed when I entered the relationship was completely shattered. And I was taking my anger out on my children. And I didn't like the woman or the parent that I had become. But I could remember being happy once. And I wanted to find my way back to that version of me. But I felt so stuck. I was married. I had kids. How could I leave? I didn't believe in myself enough to think that I could make it on my own, that I could support my kids. And then I started diving into personal development to find a path to help myself. And I wanted to help others too. So I became a certified life coach and then a certified passion test facilitator in 2014. And that summer, I came home to the U.S. from where we'd been living in the U.K. to visit with my family. It was just the kids and me for the first time in two years, and one of less than a handful of times I'd ever been allowed to travel without my husband. It was amazing to be around my friends and family, and I noticed after just a few days that I started to relax. I noticed that these people who said that they loved me actually treated me like it, too. And I was excited not just to visit this family and old friends, but to practice my new skills with them. I wanted them to be my guinea pigs. So as I as I came home, I said, okay, who wants to take the passion test with me? Who wants to let me try this out and practice on you? And I gathered together a small group of old friends and my mother, and I took them through the passion test, which is a way of clarifying what matters the most to you in your life right now. And I was preparing them to make their list, to complete the sentence, when my life is ideal, I am. And I told them, okay, fill in the blanks with what life would be like if there was nothing stopping you, no obstacles whatsoever. You can have anything you want. This is not where you settle for what you could have, what would be good enough, what you think you could get. No, this is where you shoot for the stars and write down what you want from your heart of hearts. And as I said those words, I felt with my whole body how out of integrity I was. I was settling. I was miserable in my marriage. And it was negatively impacting everything, including my kids. And at that moment, I remember thinking, I have a choice to make. I could stay and keep trying as I had done for years, or I could make a new choice. I could choose me. I could choose, instead of staying stuck and unhappy, to start moving forward. And so I did. I chose to stay home. I chose to leave my husband 
And even though as a single mom, I'm smiling now, there were struggles day by day, week by week. I practiced the tools of happiness that I had begun to learn practices that I still use each and every, every single day to continue up leveling my own happiness and moving through life's challenges with grace and ease. I practiced feeling and honoring and expressing my feelings instead of holding everything inside. I started making choices for myself that I respected, and I started to repair the love and trust in myself. I began questioning the old patterns of thinking that had me believing I was stuck in an abusive relationship. And I practiced continually noticing that I always have a choice in any situation. When I look back at where I was all those years ago, I'm really freaking proud of the choices that I've made, the work that I've done to open up my life to a world of possibilities. You may have never had to make the decision to leave a marriage, though you might have. I know a few of you have. But I'm wondering if you could remember a time in your own life, in your own experience, when you felt stuck. Raise your hands if you've ever felt stuck or unhappy with yourself or your life. Yeah, that's a lot of hands. Maybe it's right now. Maybe that's why you're here today. What I know for sure is that if I can transform my life from feeling miserable and stuck to being one of the happiest people I know, you can too. And I am putting a stake in the ground for all of you who want a happier, more joyful life. You can heal your heart. You can change your mind. And you can open to all the possibilities that life has to offer. You can practice the tools that will help you lower your stress and handle it better. You can feel peace and calm in your body. You can feel more joy and more happiness in your life every day. If it's possible for me, it's possible for you. And all it takes is actually using some of the tools that you'll learn today to practice and develop the habits of happiness. You've learned one key already. Now you know how to go from chaos to calm in five minutes or less. Are you ready to learn the next two? Show me your hands. Let me see. Yes, head nods. I love it. Thank you. Good smiles. All right. So let's bust that big myth of happiness. And we need to begin by defining first what happiness is. So I use the definition from the New York Times bestselling book, Happy for No Reason by Marcy Shimoff. And let me share. Oops, my screen again. One day they'll have verbal commands that say, share my screen and it'll just seamlessly pop up. All right, so here's our working definition of happiness today. An inner state of peace and well-being that doesn't depend on circumstances. Marcy calls it being happy for no reason. She's actually who trained me in this work and science of happiness. An inner state of peace and well-being that doesn't depend on circumstance. How many of you have ever had the thought, well, I'll be happier when, when I get that raise, that promotion, that amazing romantic partner, or in my case, that divorce, when my kids start helping around the house, or when the weather is warmer, or cooler, or whatever. Anybody have any kind of thought pattern like that? I'll be happier when? Yes. <laughs> All those external factors that we're just waiting on to change so we can be happy as if we can't be happy right now. This is the big myth of happiness, my friends, because you can be happy right now. All it takes is practice. <laughs> Without these practices of happiness, no matter what changes on the outside, the inside is still the same. You're still the same. That's why we define happiness as an inner state of peace and well-being that doesn't depend on circumstances. And this does not mean that you will feel happy all the time, right? Life happens. You're not going to walk around with a silly grin on your face, skipping through fields of sunflowers all the time. You're not going to feel like that because you're human, having a human experience. And so authentic happiness isn't about living in any kind of denial or toxic positivity. This is authentic happiness, which means you will still feel feelings that naturally come up, grief, sadness, frustration. And you have this backdrop, backdrop of inner peace and well-being that allows you to move through those challenges more easily and quickly. It's not a temporary feeling. It's an inner state of being. 
one of my clients came to me in the midst of a breast cancer diagnosis. She took my deep dive into happiness group program with me during her chemo. And at the end of it, she remarked how easy treatment had been from her. She actually had a little guilt like, oh, this was so easy. I see other people, you know, suffering through their chemo and this was easy for me. She practiced the tools and she used them for her body and mind and chemo felt easy. These tools work when we use them. Now I want to share some of the most exciting, important, interesting research findings in the last 20 years in the study of happiness and positive psychology. Okay. And we've all heard the question, do you see the glass as half full or half empty, right? Sometimes it feels like we're born with a particular outlook and it's either optimistic or pessimistic. And that is actually partially true, but luckily it's not the end of the story. So we have this happiness set point, a genetic and learned tendency to remain at a certain level of happiness, but it can be adjusted. So it works like a thermostat and no matter what happens in our life, good or bad, we generally hover around this same set point unless we consciously do something to change it. That's why people who win the lottery are happier for a short time, but within about a year, they return to their original happiness set point, most often their original financial set point, but that's another class. And the same is true of people who have challenges or tragedies. In about a year, they return pretty close to their original happiness set point. And so we can swing up or down a bit, but if we do nothing about it, it will remain somewhat constant. But if we do something about it, and this is the good news, with some practice, we can raise it. And that is what these practices that you're learning today are for. Since the set point is very important, it's really the key to our happiness, let's see how it is determined. It is. 50% genetic. You are born with it. Ta-da! Get ready. It's only 10% circumstances. This is such a tiny piece of the pie, and yet it's the one everyone is trying to control in order to be happy. That myth of more we talked about, that big myth of happiness. If this changes, then I can be happy. But this is only 10% of your happiness pie, my friends. The other 40% is your habits, habits of thoughts and behavior. So what you think and what you do, and this is what you have the most control over changing. And it turns out that the biggest difference between happy people and unhappy people is simply that they have different habits. They have different habits. Taking it one step further, scientists who study epigenetics, the study of our genes and DNA and how they're expressed, say that this 50% piece can actually be influenced by our thoughts and behavior, by our habits. And that means that we have up to 90% influence on our happiness set point. 90%. That's pretty awesome, don't you think? And notice it's not what's happening out there that we have the influence on. It's what's happening in here. So you might be asking yourself, as many people do, well, that sounds easy, Tamara. Why don't more people just change a few habits then? <laughs> Any of you ever tried to dump a bad habit? <laughs> yeah? Was it easy? Mm -mm. No, no. So why? Let's do a little experiment to uh, see why. So I invite you to put your hands together, clasp them together. Okay, good. Checking over here so I can see everybody. I only see a few of you on the screen. Notice which thumb is on top. Okay, take a look. Now, those of you with your right thumb on top, the research says that you're the better thinkers, but you probably knew that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, those of you with your left thumb on top, the research says you're the sexier bunch. <laughs> Okay, now that was just for fun. Anybody have your both your thumbs uh, like that? Well, if you do or you try this with your friends or family, they only think they're sexier. <laughs> All right, here's the real experiment. Open up those hands, 
slide your fingers so that the opposite thumb is on top. And I'm sorry, this won't make you smarter or sexier, but notice how it feels. And after a moment, you can unclasp your hands and share in the chat. How does it feel? Or you can even unmute yourself and share with the group. How does it feel to switch that hand position? Totally awkward. Totally awkward. Odd. I'm seeing uncomfortable. Mm hmm. Uncomfortable. Weird. Weird. Yeah. Slightly awkward. Good. Kevin's practiced this one before. So it's only slightly awkward now. <laughs> Not natural. Right. It's weird. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. And this is why people don't make the necessary changes to create habits of happiness because it feels weird. We don't like it. So we don't do it or we try it and then we don't continue it. You've probably heard that the subconscious mind is running about 95% of the show, but here's something you might not know. The subconscious mind also loves the status quo. It loves what it knows, and it works really hard to protect us from change. It wants us to stay the same. Even when what we think we're experiencing, we think it sucks. <laughs> we think we want a healthier relationship or we want to kick that bad habit or we want to exercise more. Our subconscious mind says, oh, no, that's not. No, we don't want to do that. Just go ahead and have that cookie or, yeah, date that same guy you've dated 10 times in different skin suits. You're fine. This is what we know. Let's keep it up. <laughs> so. We have to start doing the new behavior until it starts to feel more comfortable. And when you do it enough, I bet you if you practiced switching your hands every day for the next week, it would start to feel more comfortable and like your new normal. I like to say this to my people. Change is hard. <laughs> It's hard, man. It feels like this. Oh. Change is hard at first, though. It's messy in the middle, and it's glorious at the end when you've experienced the benefits of that change. And your subconscious mind will get on board once it starts to experience the benefits. So if January 1st, your plan is to get on that new exercise program, but it pushes you to your physical limits and you're sore the next day, your subconscious mind is going to say, sweetie, just lay down on the couch, watch Netflix, chill out, you relax, take care of yourself. We don't need that exercise. But now you have learned this. So you're aware of this pattern of sabotage. So you say to yourself, I'm going to do it anyway. And then you do it. And then the next day you wake up and you say, I'm going to do it anyway again. It doesn't feel good yet, but I'm going to keep doing it until you notice that you start to feel better. It starts to feel easier. That's when the motivation kicks in after you experience the benefits. Most of us are waiting for motivation to kick in to start something, but we've got it backward. The motivation comes after we start feeling the benefits. And a word about habit. How many of you think it takes 21 days to make a new habit? Raise your hands. Yeah, you've heard that. Mm -hmm. It's false. It takes 21 days to start feeling more comfortable in a new habit that you're cultivating. But in fact, it takes around 72 days. I know I say around, but that's very specific, but that's what the research shows. Around 72 days for a new behavior to become a fully formed habit. And that's one of the reasons why I work with clients now for a minimum of six months, because it gives them time to fall off the happiness habit wagon a couple of times with the loving accountability from me to get back on until it sticks. I had another client come to me last year. He was a young guy in his mid thirties and had lost his zest for life. Everything felt hard. He's a single dad to two kids, adolescents, and he had this mountain of have to do's on his shoulders and wasn't experiencing joy with his kids, with his work or life in general. And together we identified what mattered the most to him in his life right now through that passion test, and then applied the tools and habits of happiness that worked best for him in his situation. It's not a one size fits all. That's why there are lots of tools. 
We got him comfortable in his discomfort, which was a lot of fun, actually, incorporating fun back into his experience and reprogramming his neurology so that he had more positive thinking. Small, simple changes that built up over time completely changed his experience. And after just six months, less than a year of working with me, learning and using the tools with loving accountability, he loved his life again. I saw him a few weeks ago, a year after he started working with me, and he's so happy. He told me that he feels like he's in the flow and ease of life, and his relationships with his kids have dramatically improved. They have fun together as a family now. They feel close, and it even carried over into his ex-wife's home, and that's amazing. Today, I'm sharing just a snippet of the information, tools, and practices that I've been amassing for the past 10 years. I don't have time to give it all to you in 60 to 90 minutes, and I've learned over the years that I'm not doing my job in being of service to you if I don't offer you an opportunity to dive deeper with me if it feels right for you today. So later, I'll be sharing the details of my newly revamped group program, A Deep Dive into Practical Happiness. But for now, I'm going to briefly introduce what we found are the seven main areas of happiness and the habits And we'll dig into one of them a little deeper so that you can reduce those thoughts of overwhelm like I promised. Uh, In the group program, we spend a week or two or three or a full month on each area, breaking down old patterns of thoughts and behavior and learning two or three practices to create new patterns to ensure those habits have a strong base before we move on to the next one. Now, I mentioned seven areas. I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to remember seven of anything. So we put it into a metaphor uh, as an easy way to remember, and it's called your home for happiness. So we're going to build our home for happiness. What do we need? You can pop it into the chat. When we build a new home, what's the first thing we do? foundation. Yes. Thank you, Renee, because I can't see the chat now. (laughs) We need to put in a strong foundation. The foundation in your home for happiness is about taking responsibility for your own happiness, not putting it on other people, places, things, jobs. You take responsibility for your own happiness. And as we go through these, be sure to note where you consider yourself strong and where you notice you might be a little weaker and just pay attention to that. So in this foundation area, are you a victim? Is life happening to you? A woe is me? Or are you a victor, right? Are you showing up strong? Do you take the necessary action to support it? Or are you complaining and blaming everybody else. This one can be very tricky for people. We don't want to be at fault for what's not going right in our lives. But when we build a new home, we need a very strong foundation. So we do spend a few weeks on this in the deep dive. The second habit or main area of happiness is the pillar of the mind. Do your thoughts support your happiness or do you have a lot of negative thinking that robs you of your happiness? We are going to dig into this one tonight, so I'll move on. The third area is probably my favorite, but it's possible I say that about every area. Uh, The pillar of the heart. Do you live with an open heart, with love, gratitude, kindness, and generosity? Or do you live with a closed, contracted heart? Do you often experience anger, resentment? Do you find it very hard to forgive? In the deep dive, participants learn some incredible exercises and hear miraculous stories related to the heart and forgiveness. And one of the most transformational exercises and tools that I've ever used in my own life is Ho'oponopono. And we share that when we cover that section. The fourth area is the pillar of the body. Do y'all know you only get one? (laughs) Are you taking care of it? Do you have the biochemistry of happiness? This one can be tricky because it actually involves exercise and sleep and proper nutrition, which can be very hard for us humans. Are you getting what you need in those areas? Next up is the pillar of the soul. 
This one isn't about being religious or even spiritual, but it is about feeling connected to that bigger energy of life, whatever you call it. It might just be other people. You feel that connection. You know you're not just one being floating solo through life. In this section, we learn different practices, some meditations to help us cultivate that bigger connection with source or God, the universe, whatever you call it. In my podcast, Spirit Cafe, we've boiled it down. We just call it the yada yada now. (laughs) Um, So do you feel that connection? We can cultivate it and be happier. And then we put the roof on our home. And this is about living a life with purpose and passion. Do you feel inspired? by life? Or does it just feel like you're trudging through it? Do you do things that regularly bring meaning and purpose into your experience? And this is where the passion test comes in, where I take every single one of my clients, either in a group or one-on-one through the passion test. It helps you to remember what lights you up. And then when you start doing them, you become more joyful and life becomes more fulfilling. And then we have our garden. This has to do with who you are surrounding yourself with. Are you surrounded by a lot of toxic people, all those weeds in your garden? Do you have a hard time setting boundaries or saying no? Mm -hmm. Or do you cultivate beautiful relationships? This is the habit of happiness, cultivating, nourishing, supportive relationships. I wish I could share all of it with you right now. But if your interest is piqued and you're ready to dig deeper and you're willing to invest some time and energy into yourself, you can jump into the program with me even before this class is over. We begin in January so that you can make 2023 your strongest, happiest, and most easeful yet. So take a look at the house again and see where you think you're strongest and where you're weakest. And Pop that into the chat. Where are you strongest? Where are you weakest? I figured out how to see the chat. <laughs> so Now I know from my own experience and working with hundreds and hundreds of clients at this point that many of us, yep, Roseanne hit it. Many of us have Uh, some struggles in that relationship area, setting boundaries and keeping them and communicating with love and firm boundaries. Uh, Strongest in purpose. Great, Lucy. Weakest relationships. Yep. Kathy, your roof. Is your roof your strongest or your weakest? Okay, Kevin. Thank you. Strong body, but that mindset might need some work. Yeah. Yeah. And notice we're all different. Like everybody's got some different strengths and some different weaknesses and everybody has some both. So did anyone have a major aha moment while I shared those that um, you'd like to share with the group? Any big ahas going, maybe you didn't realize this was an area where you weren't so strong in, or you realized, gosh, yeah, I'm good at this one. Anybody want to share? You can just unmute yourself. Oh, for, for me, it just reinforced like how everything works together. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you need the foundation and that's, that's good to have. It's, you know, it's necessary, but then everything else is like, I like the analogy because it's a pillar and take away one pillar, everything else is weak and it doesn't hold up. So. Yeah. Thank you. That was like, I didn't even put that in the talk. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it, they I all just want to follow up. Can yeah. I? Because I totally um, agree, and that's what I noticed too. Is like, and I think that was why I couldn't pinpoint what my strongest and weakest were, is because I feel like I'm building a little bit on each of those pillars mm-hmm. as I grow. Yeah. Yes, they're interdependent. So some of us have a little more work to do in some areas but they all work together and I'll I'll talk more about that when I share some things a little later. Anybody else before we move on? Okay. Now you've learned the quick coherence technique to move from chaos to calm in just minutes. We've busted the big myth of happiness so you know that it's 
right now, not when then, that we create more inner peace, well-being, and joy for ourselves. So now let's talk about the mind and how to reduce those thoughts that lead to feelings of overwhelm. I will, I should keep my water on my left side so that I can take a drink while I share my screen. See, I learned something new every virtual masterclass. All right. So Remember that pillar of the mind has to do with our thinking and the neural pathways in our brains. And the catchphrase here is, don't believe everything you think. Just because you have a thought does not mean that it is true. I had a thought that I was stuck in my marriage, but guess what? I wasn't. I only thought that I was. What we think What we tell ourselves is the basis of our self-esteem. And unfortunately, low self-esteem is an epidemic. Two out of three adults have low self-esteem. That's a very high percentage. So right now, go ahead and switch into gallery mode. And look at the person on your left or above you if you don't have anyone on your left. And then look at the person on your right or below you if you don't have anyone on your right. and Only one of you is okay. (laughs) I'll leave it to you to figure out who that is. (laughs) All right. How many of you have children? Raise your hands. Yeah, lots of us. Me too. 80% of our first graders report high self-esteem. That's pretty good, right? Uh, By the time they're in fifth grade, it's down to 20%. By the time they're seniors in high school, it's down to just 5%. Now, I have a senior in high school, and this is true for her too, down to 5%. If you have kids, grandkids, I hope that you will share with them some of what you're learning today because they really are the future, and self-esteem creates a much happier life. Our self-esteem is based on something called our self-talk. How many of you talk to yourself during the day? Let me see a show of hands. Oh, thank you for telling the truth. (laughs) Now, for those of you who aren't raising your hands, are you saying to yourself, I don't know, do I talk to myself during the day? Maybe I do. I could. (laughs) Yeah, we all do it. We talk to ourselves all day long. It is called thinking. How many thoughts a day? do you think the average person has? Go ahead and put that into the chat or even unmute yourself and shout out a guess. How many thoughts a day does the average person have? About seven billion. Oh God, I hope not, Renee. (laughs) Uh, All right, let's find out. Survey says... On average, we have 60,000 thoughts a day. On average, might be more, might be less. Some might have the same thought over and over, but on average, we have 60,000 thoughts a day. Okay. What percentage of those thoughts that you have today are the same thoughts that you had yesterday and the day before, and the day before that. Go ahead and take a guess on what percentage of your thoughts are repeating day after day. Mary, 90, too many, right? You're both very close. (laughs) Any other guesses of what percentage of that 60,000 thoughts? I like that very specific 78%, Kevin. 80 to 90, yeah, you guys are pretty close. Feels like 100%, Roseanne says. 95% of our thoughts are repeated. Same yesterday, same day before, same day after that. Our minds are like record players on repeat. They keep going over and over the same things again and again. Startling, but none of you are actually surprised by this. So let's do another fun experiment. And you can unmute yourselves for this one. And uh, we're going to spell out loud together a word. So everybody go ahead and unmute yourselves. Take a moment. That way we can hear each other. It's more fun this way. All right. Unless you have dogs barking or babies crying, don't don't unmute yourself then. All right. So I'd like you to spell out loud with me the word silk, like a silk scarf. Okay, ready? 
S I I T L A K. Good. Now let's say it together three times. Silk. 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 Now what do cows drink? Milk. Milk. Water. Water. Oh, yeah. I don't know what the cows drink where a few of you are from, but yes, here in Michigan, it is water. Well, baby cows drink. No, do, but I That's didn't right. ask Good about point. baby cows. <laughs> I would have That's said so cows. I'm specific like that. <laughs> All right. See, our minds get hooked on these patterns and they just go over and over the same things. Let's try another one just for fun. Spell the word roast, like roast beef. R O A S T. Now let's say it together three times. Roast. 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 Bread. 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 You guys are on on top of it now. Usually I get a few people at least twice. All right. Thank you for playing along. Well done. Go ahead and mute yourselves again now. Here is the most important piece of the research. If I can find my share screen again. All right. The most important piece of the research. What percentage of an average person's thoughts in any given day do you think are negative? Go ahead and pop that in the chat. What percentage do you think of those 60,000 average thoughts is negative? Mary says 90. Lori says 90. You guys are going high now. Lucy says 70. <laughs> Kevin, you're cracking me up. 87.2%. At least 50, 75. All right, you guys are up there and you're not so far off. 80% of the average person's thoughts are negative every day. This is why we feel so drained at the end of the day. It is not that we're so busy or doing so much or that we worked out really hard. It's that our negative thoughts are actually robbing us of our energy. And if you lean toward the negative, no, you're not alone. Scientists call this the negativity bias. And it's actually something that we have inherited from our caveman ancestors who had to remember the negative or they die. Yes, Mary, our brains think those negative thoughts to keep us safe. We had to know where the poison berries were or where the saber tooth tiger was going to pop out and eat us. We had to remember those things. And our brain hasn't evolved as quickly as civilization has. So we still have this like immediate response of fight or flight when things are going on. So we don't need this bias like we used to, but we still have it. And there's an author named Rick Hansen. He's the happiness expert and author of The Buddha's Brain and Hardwiring Happiness. And he refers this to this as the Velcro versus Teflon syndrome. Our minds are like Velcro to the negative. It just sticks to us. We can't shake it off. But our minds are like Teflon for the positive and the positive just slides right off of us. But happier people have reversed to this. They Velcro the positive and they Teflon the negative. What we put our attention on grows stronger in our life. So when we're focusing on the positive, we get more of it. It grows stronger in our lives. When we have the habit of paying attention and Velcroing the negative, we've developed strong neural pathways toward the negative and we notice it more consistently. Happier people have retrained their brains to be on the lookout for the positive. And once they're on the lookout, that's what they see. They are, there are beautiful, beautiful things in front of us all day long. And this is why it's so powerful to put your attention on the positive, because when we do that, we create and strengthen our neural pathways toward the positive, and we see more of it. To demonstrate the power of our attention, we're going to watch a video of some students tossing a basketball to each other. This is a selective attention test, and if you've seen this before, just watch and enjoy. But we're going to be watching this video of students tossing a basketball to each other, and your job is to count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Okay, what's your job? To count what? 
You can say it out loud to yourself. Put it in the chat. Unmute yourself. What's your job? Player in white. How many times do they pass the basketball? Yes. So count the players in white. How many times do the players in white pass the basketball? Um, make sure that you're giving your full attention to this video and count the number of times the players in white pass the basketball. This is a test of selective attention. I don't know if you can hear the audio, but it really doesn't matter. So the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? How many passes did you count? I got 11. 11. How many saw 12? How many saw 13? Four. Okay, we got a 12, a 15. How many saw 16? Anybody see 17? Anybody count 18? You were hallucinating if you did. <laughs> the correct answer is 15. Now. How many of you saw the gorilla? <laughs> For those of you who think I've gone crazy talking about a gorilla, uh, let's watch the video again. I'll watch it in reverse for a second. Good job, Alexis. But did you see the gorilla? <laughs> okay that's funny becky noticed it but she didn't even register so um right wow so what happened why didn't you see the gorilla out there holding his chest in the middle of kids passing the basketball the deal is that we have two billion bits of information coming our way every single second, but our minds can only handle five to seven things. And we only notice what we're programmed to pay attention to. So if we're programmed to pay attention to the negative, that's what we see, right? If I tell you only pay attention to the players in white, that's what you look for. That's what you see. If the positive is the gorilla, you're never going to see it. And that's what gets us into overwhelm and exhaustion. It's our negative thinking. People who practice happiness are programmed to see the positive. And I'm going to share with you three practices to retrain your brain toward the positive so that you notice it more. So first, look for the good. Start looking for the good. Uh, one of the women interviewed for the book, Happy for No Reason, pretends that she's the Academy Award Committee, and her job is to give out five awards every day uh, for cuteness or happiness or whatever. And Mary looks for reasons to be grateful. That's perfect. Uh, but this lady, she might see you in the park walking your cute dog, and she might think to herself, that's the cutest dog of the day award. It's a fun, easy way to be on the lookout for the good. Now, the second step is to savor the good. It takes a split second for our brains to register a negative to either create or strengthen a neural pathway toward the uh, negative, but it takes at least, at least 20 seconds to register the good to create or strengthen a neural pathway toward the positive. So you might notice it and see it, but that neural pathway isn't going to be strengthened if you don't savor it and really take it in. Most of us dismiss the good stuff. Somebody pays you a compliment and you discard it. Oh, these old things, never mind. Or you did a great job on that project and you say it was nothing, but you know you worked hard on it. So take it in. Say thank you. Let it land. And you can say, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I worked really hard on it. And you savor that good moment so that it strengthens the pathway. Maybe you see a beautiful sunset or a lovely flower 
just savor it. Maybe you get a really good hug, right? Some of my meetup members are here today and we love hugs. A 20 second hug gets that oxytocin flowing and it's amazing. The third step is to go for a three to one ratio. And that means for every one negative thought that you catch yourself in, you replace it with three positives. So if you think here, here's, here's my most persistent negative thought. I'm going to let you in on my, my negative secret is, man, that guy doesn't know how to drive in a roundabout. <laughs> and then I catch myself and think maybe He's got a fish tank in the car and he has to go really slowly or maybe, so I'm, I'm ma I make things up and that's okay. Your brain doesn't know the difference between what's real, remembered, made up, uh, or imagined. So then I'll think, or maybe they have a new puppy in the car and they don't want him sliding around, or maybe they, they're a brand new driver, right? That I have teenage drivers. So this gives me a lot more patience. Yes, Lucy. Make the most generous assumptions about people. Be kind in your assumptions about people. And it's an easy way and a kind of a funny way to outweigh the negative and tip the scales toward the positive. Yeah, me too. Renee, I feel you. <laughs> Especially because I learned how to drive in roundabouts in the United Kingdom. <laughs> Going the opposite direction, you're all driving. Well, most of you, there's one of you here from the United Kingdom, at least. Um, and like eight lane roundabouts, not these little piddly three. I'm like, why can't you guys do this? But then I replace those thoughts so that I can go on feeling good in my life. I practice these habits on a daily basis. And I'll tell you again, I have three teenagers, okay? Two of whom struggle with depression, anxiety. They're from a divorced home. They've got that high functioning alcoholic father and they deal with a lot of heavy stuff. And I'd still wager to say that 80% of my thoughts on the average day are positive. The negative ones creep in, but my habit is in noticing them, questioning them, and then leaning into the positive so that I can feel good. Plus, I'm able to recognize because of the work that I do on myself, what's mine and what's theirs. So instead of taking on the thoughts and emotions of your kids, your coworkers, your partner, your clients, or mine, I notice what's mine and what's theirs, and I'm taking care of myself consistently, body, mind, and spirit. Sometimes how we feel physically can create our thoughts. That's true if we're sick or we have an injury, but more often it's our thinking that creates how we're feeling emotionally. Now, if you left today and only practiced this one thing of noticing the positive and really leaning into it, I believe that would transform your experience the fastest. Get your thinking cleaned up, and life changes. All seven areas, as we talked about earlier, play off one another, especially the first two, the foundation and the mind. In the foundation, we bring uh, more awareness to our bad mental hygiene, such as complaining and blaming. I first started offering these classes on happiness while I was still working in senior living, and I spent a week on each. And uh, one week after focusing on the foundation, where we gave up a bad habit, uh, one of my residents burst into my office and she said, Tamara, you changed my life. And I said, okay, tell me what, what I do. Uh, she had committed to making one simple change, stopping complaining to her son on their daily phone calls. And it radically changed her level of happiness. She took dedicated action that probably wasn't easy to start with, but it was simple. And she changed the way she thought and she changed her experience one day at a time. So what will you commit to today? In my 10 years of working with clients, nearly 10 years, I have learned that true and lasting change occurs with baby steps. We don't take the big leap and stay there. We start small with committed daily action. And once the first thing becomes a habit, we can add on more and having someone to keep us accountable helps even more. So just for fun, before we go on, let's take a look at someone who has very strong neural pathways toward the positive, probably even stronger than mine. This is a 
Oops, not this one. Hang on. I said that. Here we go. Here's some evidence of strong neural pathways. Soak this in. Can you guys hear this? Hold on, I'm gonna stop the share and make sure that I'm sharing my audio because I want you to hear sweet little Jessica. So share screen, share sound, here we go. Okay. It's dark. Now my whole house is great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my mom. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my hair. I like my hair. I like my haircuts. I like my pajamas. I like my stuff. I like my rooms. I like my whole house. My whole house is great. I can do anything good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do anything good. Better than anyone. Better than anyone. Isn't that great? Those are some serious uh, neural pathways toward the positive. I love that. All right. When you make these three practices a habit every day, you'll start to notice the change rather quickly. So be on the lookout for the good savor it. And for everyone negative, lean into three positive. That's how we flip that negativity bias into a positivity bias. And the good news is that anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. Okay. Our time is nearly up and we still have a few things to do. I want you now, without looking back at your original score, to go ahead and rate your current level of happiness right now in this moment. Notice how you're feeling and give it a score from one to 10. And wow, Lori, you're one up a couple of not notches. All right. Uh, yep. Take a moment. Nines now, tens. <laughs> so great, Lucy. Yay, nine out of ten. Eight. Becky, yours went up really high. Awesome. So most of you, did all of you maybe, did everybody's happiness score raise? Okay. Even if it's a fraction, even if it's half a point, it went up. And I want you to just notice that in just a little over an hour, you've raised your happiness through simple yet powerful practices. Now imagine sustaining that increase, raising your set point to the point where you feel an inner state of peace and well being consistently, where circumstances can change unfavorably, but you, your happiness keeps increasing because you know how to move through the challenges. You know how to take care of your body and your mind in a way that supports your happiness. Anything is possible when you believe it is and you take the action to make it happen. I'm going to take a, a few questions in a few minutes, but first I want to share some statistics with you for your encouragement. If you don't believe it already, these practices are worth the effort. Uh, let's get to these. Happy people are 35% less likely to get sick. You heard my story of avoiding the COVID plague in my own household. Cortisol levels, the stress response, are 32% lower in happier people. Sleep disorders are 47% higher for unhappy people, which means 53% lower than uh, in happier people. And uh, happier people, on average, live nine years longer. And if better health and a longer life doesn't do it for you, maybe this will. Happy people make on average a million dollars more over the course of their lifetime than unhappy people. So let's take a moment to check in. What has been your biggest aha so far this afternoon? You can either raise your hand or just unmute yourself and share or pop it into the chat. What's your biggest aha from what you've learned today? Anybody? <laughs> I'll share. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think for me, one of the big things was you mentioned, you know, not letting other people's 
energies and moods affect your own and how that can be different. And um, so remembering that in the midst of perhaps my own teenage person melting down doesn't mean that I have to melt with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Because when we don't melt with them, we can actually support them through what they're experiencing. Right. So important. Kathy says that genetics has a high impact. It does. But remember that your thoughts and behavior have nearly as much and you can influence the two. What we focus on most. Yeah, we see what we focus on. What we put our attention on grows stronger in our lives. I tell a story in the Passion Dustin in my group programs about my anger and how it was affecting my kids. Uh, and when I made the commitment to change that through practices and habits of thoughts and behavior, how everything changed. Everything. Coherence technique tools. Yes, use that tool. All right. Now I'll ask you, what are you going to do with what you've learned today? With what you've experienced? Are you going to apply it? Because I'll tell you what I know. All change begins with an intention. An intention is just consciously stating what you choose to create in your life. What do you intend to create in yours? You came here today for a reason. What steps are you willing to take to create lasting change in your life, to up-level your joy, to lower your stress, to create those healthier habits of thoughts and behavior? I invite you to take a moment and set thank you. That intention in the chat, Lori says, to apply what she's learned. Brilliant. Tools only work when we use them. Practice, practice, practice. Yes, Rebecca. Changing those negative thoughts comes with noticing them first and then flipping them. Flip, Mary said, flip the negative thoughts. Perfect. Yes, my friends. These are all so good. And yes, to ask, ask for support. Ask for support for each of you. I have one more thing I want to teach you. We're going to get out as close as we can to three o'clock, but I have a free gift with no strings attached. So don't go anywhere yet. Stay until the end. It will be worth it. But I want to teach you one more thing through a direct experience about the power of visualization, if I could say the word. But first, I have a question for you. How many of you have attended a talk or taken a workshop and felt like you had an amazing experience and your life was going to be forever changed? Raise your hands. (laughs) <laughs> oh, many of you. Mm, Kevin's thinking about it. but uh, And how many of you within a few days or maybe a couple of weeks went right back to where you were before? Uh-huh. You're laughing because it is true. <laughs> I see it all of the time. Remember the difference between unhappy people and happy people? It's their habits. I want to show you how to build those happiness muscles, create those new habits, and to be so strong that they become your new way of being. I love helping you stay committed and accountable so that you can actually create lasting change in your lives, just like my breast cancer survivor client, just like my single dad client who loves life again and no longer lets that overwhelm hit him because he cleans it up first. For the first time in a year, I am offering my deep dive into happiness group program, and it's new and improved. And I'm going to share a couple of slides with you real quick. Stick with me because we're going to get to some good stuff right after I share with you what I have on offer. Uh, the deep dive into practical happiness is a six-month immersive group group experience where we will dive deep into the habits and practices of happiness, so that with education, supports, encouragement, and accountability. You get everything you need to continually lower your stress and up-level your joy. The class will run Tuesdays from 7.30 to 8.45, beginning January 3rd, with a big kickoff celebration so that we kick off that new year in happiness style. And uh, this is the general layout. I'm going to flip through it, and you guys can uh, ask me more later. I'll stay on after we're done for anybody who has questions. So we'll meet essentially three times a week, except for in February, we'll meet just twice, but that month I will have uh, office hours so we can meet the third time. We'll talk about the heart in February, of course, the first month we do that foundation. Uh, I switched these around a little bit. No, I didn't. That's good. Um, March, the mind, and we're going to tackle your inner critic in April, the pillars of the body and soul in May, 
We're going to spend a lot of time creating purpose and meaning in your experience. This is where you get the passion test and uh, so much more fun. I heard a TED Talk recently that shared a statistic that people in their 60s who felt no sense of purpose and meaning in their lives each day had a life expectancy of five years or less. Purpose and meaning keeps us going. And in this section, I'll also introduce you to the story of my grandmother who lived with purpose until her very last days at 101 years old. In our final month, we get into the garden and examine your relationships in life. We learn how to create and keep healthy boundaries. And then we practice setting them and keeping them so that you have a solid script and confidence when you're setting them and learning how to say no to others so you can say yes to yourself. Each month you get Q&A and coaching sessions and you'll all have access to one one one-on-one call with me at any point during the deep dive or private coaching. Now, just like professional athletes need coaches to stay at the top of their game, a coach like me helps you live life at the top of yours. And accountability matters and it makes such a huge difference. Accountability matters and so do you. So I help you create a life you love one of greater happiness, greater purpose, a lot more efficiently than if you were doing it on your own. It took me like seven years to get this stuff down. And most of my clients get there in a fraction of that time. And that's what I want for you. One of my clients came back, I'll just stop the share for a second, uh, came to me in the midst of a divorce. She was going through a major relocation as well. She had lived for 14 years with her husband in Uh, Europe. And then he cheated on her and told her he wanted a divorce. So she moved back home. And that was some massive transition, unwanted and unexpected. And she was so angry and so bitter and so hurt. And she knew that, yes, I'll repeat that statistic in a minute, Kevin. She knew that she didn't want to live that way. She didn't want to stay that way. She didn't want to have all that junk in her body. So she worked with me one-on-one and also in the deep dive and barely a year after her divorce was final. And that was just like last month. Uh, She's happier than she's ever been. And she's in a beautiful and loving relationship with herself, with herself, feeling no need for romance at the moment. She's thriving. And she says that without those practices that she learned and the accountability to actually practice them, she'd still be carrying around that debilitating anger. And what all of the participants of the deep dive have said is how valuable it is to be in a space with other people experiencing similarly painful transitions or life experiences. Knowing that you're not alone and learning and growing in community within a group like this, it's powerful. Plus you do it with a coach who's there to teach you, guide you and keep you focused where you wanna go. And I'm the coach and I'm super fun to be with. So imagine being one of the happiest people you know. This work works when you do it. Think of the impact on your career, your parenting, your life, the investment. Maybe you're asking, I hope you're asking, what do I need to do, Tamara, to get into this program is an investment into yourself and your life. And ultimately the results are priceless. But when you commit today, it's Well, it's $3,500 for the six months and it includes all this stuff on the screen and I'll pop these back up after, but one coaching session with me, access to all the recordings all year, a private group so that we can support and encourage one another. And I just show up all the time, just loving you on. And then free access to any other virtual workshops that I do throughout our time together. Typically I do an attract your perfect partner workshop in February. If you enroll today, you'll save $500. So it will be $3,000 for you. Plus you'll receive a bonus one-on-one coaching session with me and my ebook that I wrote this year, 10 tips for dating yourself. If that lump sum feels unattainable for you, I get it. I've been there. So if you make your commitment with a $500 deposit today, you won't save the $500, but there will be no added fees for a monthly program, monthly payment program. So you'll just pay $500 a month today and then through June. Um, Okay. I believe Renee will be putting those links in the chat. I think she has. Uh, 
So this is a today only special though, for being on this call with me and taking action. I invite you to feel into the possibility of what life could look and feel like in 2023. If it feels right for you, jump in right now. Click one of those links and join us. And this is one of those moments to let your heart lead. But our brains will lead us astray, but our hearts always get it right. So the link is in the chat to sign up. And if you know you're ready to deep dive and learn the skills and turn them into habits that will change your life experience and create a positive ripple through your family, your workplace, and everyone you touch, everyone you serve, that positive ripple or that positive effect ripples over them too. And if you're ready, even if you feel scared, but you know that this is you, just do it. And whether you do or not, I want to give you one more experience to show you the power that you have when you decide that something more is possible for you. Um, You're going to stand up for this one. So take a moment to do that and make space around you. You need enough room to stretch your arms all the way out around you. So I'm going to stand up too. And I'm going to move my screen back. Okay. All right. So let's get a little uh, peek into the rest of my room. All right. What you're going to do now is plant your feet solidly on the floor, maybe hip width, a uh, hip distance apart so that you're solid and planted. You are not going to move your feet for the next couple of minutes. So just keep them planted the whole time. Now what I want you to do is reach your right arm out and point and then turn without moving your feet. I had to move to adjust. So if you need to move to adjust so you can reach all the way around, do that. Turn your body, not your feet, and see how far you can point. And notice the point on the wall that you get to. Notice how far you can reach and don't move. Don't move your feet. And just notice that point. Okay, good. Now remember it. Remember that point. Now, I invite you to keep your feet planted where they are and close your eyes. If you have any balance issues, just hold on to something. We don't want you falling over. And now close your eyes and imagine yourself doing that same thing. Imagine yourself reaching out your right arm. Don't actually do it. Pointing and turning your body and your hand as far to the right as you can. Only this time, your finger points about six inches to a foot or even more further. Imagine it. See yourself reaching further. Really lock in that new point further than the one before. All right, now you can open up your eyes again. Don't move your feet. And now let's do it again. Reach out your hand and point and turn as far to the right as you can. And notice, oh, look at you, Renee. (laughs) Notice how far you get. All right, good. And uh, unmute yourself or share in the chat. It's okay if you couldn't stand, Mary. I saw you trying. Uh, and tell me, how much further did you get? Miles further. <laughs> Pretty amazing, huh? Very satisfying. Uh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> did everybody go further? Raise your hands if you went further. Jody's still trying it. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, right? See how much further we can go together with someone showing you and teaching you that you're so much more capable than you even believe, that you can go further, be happier, manage your stress like a champ, and not let anything keep you down. So if you're ready to go further and create a more beautiful life than maybe you've ever even given yourself permission to imagine, I invite you to jump in to the deep dive right now. Commit to yourself. Save $500. That payment plan is available for to, to those who need it. And if you're leaning in and you need a minute, this bonus, fast action bonus pricing is available until midnight tonight. The You'll If you sign up this weekend through Sunday, you'll still get the bonus one-on-one with me, but not the special pricing. And the faster you act, the more you get. And this is because 
Action is what creates change. Not thinking about doing something, but doing the something. So gift yourself the benefits that come with fast action. And then I have a free gift for you. It is a comprehensive happiness habits workbook that uh, details the seven habits and the three habits that go along with them. And you can get those by uh, signing up to my newsletter. Or if you're like, I don't want your stinking newsletter, Tamara, even though it's pretty fun and it doesn't come out that often, you can uh, just email me at, I don't think I gave you this link, uh, Renee, at Tamara at a life you love now and say, give me that happiness habit book, Tamara, and I will send it to you. Okay. So um, if you are on the fence and you're not sure and you want to talk to me more about this, then there's a link in the chat right there on the fence. Schedule a quick call with me. Uh, I've made some space on my calendar this weekend. I have lots of kid things tomorrow, but there's a lot of space on Sunday and Monday. And on Tuesday, I leave for a trip to Sweden. And so get into a call with me, get onto a call with me before then. And if you don't see a time that works, just grab that email and message me. All right. Any questions before we go? Thank you, Kathy. I have just one more beautiful quote to share with you. And then I'll stay on for a few minutes for questions. But let me share this beautiful quote that sums up why I do what I do. That's my little book. Those are your things. Okay. When there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. When there's beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. When there is harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. And when there is order in the nation, I keep forgetting to fix that typo. There will be peace in the world. This is why I do what I do. I'm grateful for you for being here and giving yourself this time and these learnings. And if you have any questions, I'll hang out. But thank you. I'm grateful for all of you. I appreciate you.